like to hand over to our next speaker, who is uh, Sam Watts of Make Real. Uh, he's going to be talking a little bit about how uh, they at Make Real have gone through the process of converting uh, their existing web uh, vi existing VR experiences into uh, WebXR experiences. What that process has entailed. Hello everyone, it's great to be back at Brighton Immersive Meetup. Uh, we're going to be talking about browser-based immersive experiences today, uh, or rather we're going to be talking about WebXR. My name is Sam Watts and I'm the Immersive Partnerships Director at Make Real. We're a local Brighton-based studio specialising in immersive content. We work with a number of clients and partners over the years, having delivered 100 plus projects. Uh, from everything to do with agriculture and automotive to construction through to museums, uh, simulation and utilities companies. I've been on a journey over these few years uh, trying out everything XR from AR devices and VR headsets, uh, learning what does and doesn't work so that we can pass this knowledge on to our clients. Part of that has seen me doing a number of talks and presentations around the benefits of using immersive technologies for training, but also on the experiential in and out of home uh, entertainment side of things as well. Funnily enough, uh, actually in 2016, we started hosting our own uh, web VR meetups. And we held two. We had um, companies like Play Canvas come down and talk for us. Uh, but unfortunately, I think the tech at the time was a little bit immature and um, we soon ran out of uh, uh, valid content to keep the audiences engaged. So it's great to see the Brighton Immersive Meetups covering the topic now that things have matured a bit more. I'm going to be talking to you today about uh, two of our more recent projects, our internal product DNI perspectives and what we created for legal in general. Uh, sponsors of Brighton Immersive Meetup uh, for their retirement planning internal tool. On to DNI perspectives uh, first up. Uh, originally, we created it as an Oculus Quest app, um, and we designed it to be through our sort of experience of working with enterprises, simple and easy to use as possible, with minimal interactions. Uh, but we wanted to explore the use of a mix of real-time 3D CG um, backgrounds and stereoscopic video axes. And then these also led into four animated uh, stories based upon real world um, uh, experiences of microaggressions within the workplace uh, created in conjunction with a, a large global financial institution. We're looking to explore how more traditional e-learning technologies and presentations could be delivered in a VR experience. But we decided that we needed to adapt it to other forms beyond just Oculus Quest. Uh, with coronavirus and lockdown, access to devices hasn't been as, as widely available. And we wanted to ensure that through a browser, uh, people were able to access the content and still have the same experience. For this particular experience, we looked at how to offer the user the choice of just going 2D on their mobile, or using the power of WebXR and loading it into VR uh, so they could put it into a Google Cardboard. So if you indulge me for a minute, here's a quick video uh, of the experience itself in VR mode. Welcome to this diversity and inclusion experience. You're about to see the world through another person's eyes. Who are you? You'll move across the office to get to your next meeting on time. As you go, think about other people's reaction to you and whether that gives you a sense of who you are. You're here. We've had a meeting about the Rocks project. Sorry, I know you were really keen to stay close to it, but I assumed you were working from home again, and Sandeep had some great ideas that we were all really keen to discuss. We made some exciting decisions. You're going to love the direction we're taking this in. Meet the team. You were just playing the role of one of these people in your journey through the office. Who do you think you were? I have a British sounding name. 
It's not obvious on paper that my parents are from Ghana. I work with clients remotely a lot. And one team I was working with, we were communicating entirely on calls and via emails. But after about a month, we had a big review coming up. So someone set up a video call. I remember that there was a visible shock in the room when they saw me for the first time. They'd all been chatting away and then the room went silent. If you felt excluded, unfairly judged or belittled every day when you stepped into the office, would you be able to do your best work? So there we go, that was a quick video uh, capture from the experience on Oculus Quest. Uh, so some of the things we have to think about when taking it to WebXR uh, from a design point of view, we have to think about the fact that we're going from a six off full VR experience where people can move around and have two, two input controllers to having a single button, maybe on a Google Cardboard, or, or no buttons at all, just looking at it on a mobile. And the spatial audio that we've in incorporated into the experience uh, less effective when you're just looking at a flat phone screen. But then also, how is it going to be hosted? How is it going to be accessed? Uh, how are we, we going to secure access to it? This is a product of ours that we want to uh, enable paid access to. Uh, and what will the typical user's intro and what will the user journey be that's different from, from the VR? experience. We have to preload everything up front so we can hide a lot of that between the option to launch the 2D or the VR version. On the performance side, we had no upfront install, um, unlike you know an app which is downloaded to the device and just plays and you can have all full control over when assets are loaded and unloaded and in memory. Uh, we had to preload everything up front because it's web and it's streaming. So you know large assets uh, we need to be carefully considered. We also had a much wider range of target devices to consider, uh, a range of mobile phones. Uh, we tried to limit down to those that we know that support cardboard too, uh, but also for the 2D version, it could have you know, less capable phones being used. Uh, as this was potentially going out to uh, end customers, we didn't have any control over that. So much like normal web design, you have to take all of these things into consideration. And then you know, based upon time and development, we created a tier of uh, quality settings depending upon what the device was that we were detecting. And then you know, the logic to basically determine how those tiers are loaded based upon what class of device, performance metrics we have, etc. Uh, for the video, uh, we had quite do quite a lot of work for the, the stereoscopic actors who were captured. Um, stereoscopy doesn't really work when you're looking at a mobile phone doesn't really work with three DOF headsets because you don't get that sense of motion that, that, that isn't tracked. Um, so it's kind of an effect that is lost, but it's a quick performance gain because then we can drop it down to a monoscopic version. And doing a lot of things real time out of the question in terms of the mobile chipsets, although we can do it with Quest, uh, you know, that, that's a highly optimized environment. So we had to look at baking a lot of the lighting in uh, to give that same sense of quality and feel uh, without the performance overheads. And then for lower end devices, we looked at just capturing 360 video versions or 180 video versions to reduce that performance requirement even, even lower and just playing back a 360 video essentially. The other development considerations, you know, there's not many tools available uh, for creating WebXR. Things that we take for granted with Unity, like animation timelines, curve editors, being able to preload and unload assets, all of this goes out the window when you're developing for, for WebXR. And to a degree as well, our own unfamiliarity, we're so used to developing Unity, WebXR is a, is a new emerging technology, so it's something we're still getting to grips with as well. Google was our friend. And then we had to determine, you know, what is that best trade-off between what do we export and tweak? What do we re rebuild from scratch? What do we need to create or recreate to get that same sense of experience and same level of quality that, that, that we, we expect for the amount of effort. What is that trade-off? Then because we were creating this 2D VR approach, um, we wanted to look at making sure that the 2D version didn't lose anything that the VR version offered. So we had to look at moving cameras and force movement, things you wouldn't do in VR, but it's fine to do on a, on a mobile phone to give that sense of being within the space, that first person view, that sense of depth of the content. 
when people couldn't fully look around, you know, how do we just carry on making sure that, that little phone screen or, or tablet screen or browser screen is, is as interesting as having that full 360 degree version. Looking at the Legal and General Retirement Planning Act now, Energy found that many of its members felt disconnected from their future selves, so they put off saving adequately due to an inability to connect with their future. Aiming to combat this, LNG partnered with us at Make Real to create an emotive VR experience that serves a dual purpose. On the one hand, it raises awareness of LNG's commitment to responsible investing. On the other, it should provide its members with greater insight into the long-term impacts of their current financial decisions and encourage action now. We initially produced this 360 video branching experience to raise awareness of retirement planning options originally deployed on Oculus Go. Due to COVID-19 and the launch of LG's new membership app, LG decided to implement the VR pension experience onto UNU. They were optimised so there were 5K on Oculus Go, and depending upon the user choices, there'd be three outcomes. We tried the Unity WebXR plugins, but unfortunately this wasn't supported, so we had to go much down to a much more base level of, of hand coding uh, the experience. So feedback from the developers who took that conversion process on board. The video playback on iOS is tricky. Uh, you have to preload all your assets. Um, it takes a lot longer on iOS than it does on Android. And iOS as well, you have to ensure that you have to trick the user into tapping the screen. Um, so we had to add a lot of extra screens and buttons and uh, user interface elements as part of the experience so that the, the video would actually start playing. And if because everything's all loaded, we have to make sure all the volume levels are correct and sometimes mute certain videos so that they're not all overlapping uh, over one another. Much like the other one, everything has to be loaded and preloaded and buffered uh, to make sure they play. Uh, the video data is being streamed uh, or downloaded from a web server is not running off a stored native app uh, and every browser is slightly different uh, so we had to create you know multiple versions for multiple browsers much like you do with typical web dev to keep everything smooth consistent quality and high performing across a variety of browsers supported then we had no multi-platform side of things it's ios and android chrome safari it all has to be dealt with in the same build so like web development you have to keep all those quirks within that one code base and pull them up accordingly depending upon what browser is detected we wanted to you know, have as much dynamic and responsive code as possible so that despite those slight differences every browser every user got the same experience and this is from our developers but ios is the new ie generally everything works fine straight away on android but with ios there always seems to be a quirk or a problem or something to overcome However, they do quote that uh, Safari is, seems to be getting worse, but for iOS especially, you know, don't just assume test and tri test and triple test again. To note though, uh, the new iOS 14.3 updates introduces a number of WebXR specific enhancements that enables a lot of the features to be platform wide rather than just only for Safari. Look, getting a bit more technical here, in terms of textures, Everything you do in WebGL, you know, it must be a power of two. Unity can make development very easy for a lot of people starting out, but everything has to be in a power of two, but Unity will, will adapt and convert these for you. Sometimes they don't make very good texture atlases, but developers often kind of forget and get a little bit lazy. But with WebGL, Web, WebXR development, you're, you're hard hand coding and you have to make sure everything is spot on and perfect and precise. But you also have a lot a lot more limits to work around further performance issues are around texture sizes you can't just have huge textures uh, for webxr you've got to be careful about things like color mode and the space all the various settings that make that sort of end look and feel different from a mobile device compared to a vr or pc um, and can even be different across actual devices and browsers transparency is much more limited it does work um, uh, in simple scenarios and it is getting better, but there's a lot of issues in terms of uh, artifacts and you just make sure you've got clean masks and clean uh, images to start with. And performance is always going to be slower running through the browser, but it's getting better. Our developers prefer the Babylon JS stuff, get that maximum performance through hand-coded optimization. Finally, just some notes from, from the devs. 
uh, I'll leave this screen up for a while for capturing. Um, but Babylon JS, A Frame, and 3JS are the main tool sets used for creating WebXR. If you need WebGL and there's no VRXR uh, for straightforward development, Babylon JS is recommended. A Frame is great for XR, and A Frame is built on 3JS. Which one you choose comes down to your coding capabilities and knowledge of, of XR development and the particular use case that you want. So I hope some of those have been useful for you thinking about developing WebXR. Capabilities are definitely getting better every day and there's a lot more friendly tool sets coming out now, but it's certainly not as friendly as Unity or Unreal development for XR. Uh, there's a lot more coding, there's a lot more hard work and effort to put into it. But the upshot is that you've got platform agnostic content and it runs in a browser. You don't need to have a store to distribute it. You can host it on a web server and it's a lot easier to, to deploy at scale so that many people can access it. So thank you for letting us talk about these experiences. I hope it's been useful and insightful. Yeah.